rather shortly. Um, so if everybody's good and ready to go, um, I think we can hit that top button. Thank you so much, Laura. Let's get Great. started and we're looking forward to the conversation. Awesome. Well, welcome everyone. I see we have a, folks that are uh, joining us uh, and, and funneling into today's Women in Water event. Um, and I think uh, while we're waiting uh, um, for uh, people to uh, join in, um, we'll just uh, get started shortly. Hello everyone and welcome to uh, the fifth Women in Water lecture for 2022. Uh, I'm Andrea Rowe, the Equity, Diversity and Inclusion Specialist at the Global Institute for Water Security and Global Water Futures at the University of Saskatchewan. I want to first begin today by acknowledging that we are all participating today from the traditional territories of First Peoples across this country. The University of Saskatchewan is located on Treaty 6 territory, the traditional territory and homeland of the Métis. All of us are meeting here from different places within and outside of Canada to talk about water. Water is the lifeblood of people and societies, connecting us to each other. Wherever you are, please take a moment to acknowledge the Indigenous heritage of the lands where you live and work, and we pay our respect to the Indigenous ancestors of these lands and waters, reaffirming our relationship with each other and our desire to have a productive conversation today. And I believe my, my audio skipped there. We are located on Treaty 6 territory and the traditional homeland of the Métis at the University of Saskatchewan. Um, I'd like to start by going over a couple of quick, quick logistics before we uh, jump into today's uh, conversation. Um, uh, I apologize, French interpretation is not available today, uh, but it will be available on the uh, after event production. Uh, if you would like to um, use the closed captioning, uh, please click the CC button in the bottom right hand corner and closed captioning is available in English. The event will be approximately one hour today uh, and all participants, um, we will ask you to remain muted uh, throughout the presentation, but you're welcome to um, put questions in the Q&A box and we will have um, opportunity to have our presenters answer these questions uh, in the last portion of today's lecture. I would like to recognize our sponsors, Global Water Futures and the Global Water Futures Young Professionals, the Global Institute for Water Security, uh, who have committed uh, the resources for today's presentation. Uh, and especially to our virtual audience, uh, the young professionals watching at the University of Saskatchewan, Laurier, Waterloo and McMaster uh, have been instrumental with Global Water Futures in bringing this series uh, forth. And in addition, today we have a special feature that we're fortunate to be partnering with the What About Water podcast. What About Water aims to empower people and communities to connect water science with stories that bring about solutions, adaptation and actions for the world's water realities. And so we would like to welcome podcast listeners uh, that are joining the women in water community for the first time today uh, and that are listening to this live streamed on Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn and YouTube. Uh, the chats on those platforms, the live stream platforms will not be monitored. And so if you would like to join the chat, please register on Zoom and you're welcome to participate in the community. Finally, we're planning to launch a women in water expert list to develop even more ways to highlight researchers working on the gender related impacts of water research. If you would like to be part of this public facing expert list, um, you can indicate your interest by registering for any of the lectures this season. Uh, and we will be in touch with more information in the spring of 2022. 
And so now I'd like to just pass it over to my colleague, Corin Schuster Wallace, uh, to say a couple of words. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this World Water Day Women Plus Water Lecture. I'm Dr. Corin Schuster Wallace. I am an associate professor in the Department of Geography and Planning at the University of Saskatchewan. I'm associate director of the Global Water Futures Research Program, and I'm also founder of the Women Plus Water Lecture Series. And as I just noted, this past Tuesday, March 22nd, marked the United Nations World Water Day. And this year's theme is groundwater, making the invisible visible. And this metaphor is important, not only because being in the ground beneath our feet, we don't always think about it, and it's quite a vast water resource that we have, but it's, we need to make the invisible visible because we don't know enough about how much water is actually in the ground in any given place at any point in time. We don't know how quickly it replenishes and we don't know whether we're using too much. And so the reason for this is that groundwater use in Canada is significant. One in three people, a third of us depend on groundwater for drinking water supplies. And this includes up to 80% of our rural populations. In fact, it's estimated that approximately 4.5 million people in Canada, so about 12% of us, rely on private groundwater wells for their drinking water. And why this is important to note is that private drinking water wells, as they name implies, means that they're outside any formal regulation or oversight. And so it becomes the responsibility of those individuals to steward and maintain their wells. So we really need to think about this. And of course, it's not just drinking water, it's agriculture. We use groundwater for so many things. And once contaminated, groundwater can be expensive, if not technologically impossible to remediate. And so this is another reason why we need to be more conscious of and proactive in protecting this invisible resource. And for this reason and, and many others, I'm really looking forward to hearing more from our panelists today. So I'm gonna hand back to Andrea for her to introduce everybody. Thank you very much and welcome. I hope you enjoy it. Thank you so much, Corin. So I'm delighted to introduce our host today, uh, Jay Filmoyetti, who is a professor uh, of hydrology and executive director of the Global Institute for Water Security at, the, Security at the University of Saskatchewan, where he holds the Canada 150 Research Chair in Hydrology and Remote Sensing. Before moving to USAS, Dr. Filmoyetti served as the senior water scientist at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Jay's research group uses satellite and develops uh, advanced computer models to track how freshwater availability is changing around the globe. A fellow, a fellow of the American Geophysical Union and the Ge uh, Geological Society of America, Jay is a regular advisor to state, provincial, and federal government officials on water security issues. Uh, Jay is also the host of our, today's uh, collaboration partner, the What About Water podcast. So I'll pass it over to you, Jay, to introduce our two uh, guests for today, Dr. Carletta Chief and Dr. Sarah Dixon Anderson. Thanks very much, Andrea. And thank you, Corin, for getting this kicked off and for setting the stage and reminding us about uh, how we need to make the invisible visible, not only on World Water Day, but, but every day. Um, thanks so much to our speakers. We're just thrilled that you're with us today. Dr. Carletta Chief is, an associate professor and extension specialist in the Department of Environmental Science at the University of Arizona and director of the Indigenous Resilience Center. As an extension specialist, she works to bring relevant water science to Native American communities in a culturally sensitive manner. Two of her primary tribal projects are the Pyramid Lake Paiute Tribe Climate Adaptation and Traditional Knowledge Project and the Gold King Mine Spill Diné Exposure Project in partnership with Diné College Dr. Chief leads the NSF Indigenous Food, Energy, and Water Security and Sovereignty Program and is training 39 graduate students. So I'm sure she's quite busy. Dr. Chief received a BS and MS in Civil and Environmental Engineering from Stanford in 1998 and 2000 and a PhD in Hydrology and Water Resources from the University of Arizona in 2007. Dr. Sarah Dixon Anderson, is an associate chair for graduate studies in the Department of Civil Engineering. 
um, and a professor in the Department of Civil Engineering at, at McMaster University. Her expertise is in the field of hydrogeology with a focus on fractured rock systems. She and her grad students conduct research on the characterization of these systems and investigate the transport and fate of particulate and chemical contaminants within them, including comprehensive understanding of these systems required to inform aquifer vulnerability studies and therefore the risks posed to drinking sources. Dr. Dixon brings this background to the study of local water security, particularly in rural, remote and indigenous communities. She collaborates with other disciplines towards a holistic understanding that encompasses the physical, social, cultural and economic elements of local water security. And I believe that we are going to start with the presentation from Dr. Dixon, Dixon Anderson. Is that correct? Hey, thank you. I'll share my screen. Can you see that all right? Okay, so I'll begin by acknowledging that I am participating today from the traditional territory of the Mississauga and Haudenosaunee nations and from the land protected by the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Agreement. I was asked to give a very brief overview of my research program, which I think aligns well with this year's World Water Day theme, Groundwater, Making the Invisible Visible. So before I begin, I want to acknowledge the team of people that includes grad students, communities, and faculty um, with whom I've collaborated and who have all contributed immensely to the thoughts and ideas and work that I'm going to share with you today. So the overarching goals of our research group are to study groundwater in the context of local water security with a particular focus on rural, remote, and marginalized communities. So the challenges in this space, as you can imagine, are really multifaceted and intersecting. And so we use a coupled approach um, to this research, meaning that we balance the physical and the social, environmental, and economic considerations in the context of a local community. And this is really fun because it means that for nearly everything we do, we work with a transdisciplinary group of people and examine problems through multiple lenses. So I think to frame this, we should talk about water security for a moment. And there are multiple definitions, but the one that I like in the context of local water security is Gray and Sadoff's which is that water security is the reliable availability of an acceptable quantity of water that is also of acceptable quality for health, livelihoods, and production, coupled with an acceptable level of water-related risks. So I think Corinne um, maybe said a few things on here, but I'll, I'll go over a little bit. Groundwater is a critically important source. And if we look at the statistics here, we can see that this is particularly true for people living in rural, remote, or marginalized communities. So in Canada, 33% of people rely on groundwater for their domestic water supply. And about 22% of people um, rely on groundwater as their only source of domestic water. In rural areas, this is nearly 80%. Um, and about 12% of people living in Canada, so four and a half million people, as Karun said, rely on privately owned and maintained groundwater systems. And it's important to note that private well users are really the sole managers of their water resource in terms of both quantity and quality. So these well users and actually future well users are at an increased risk due to the lack of regulation and oversight, but also because of the fact that these well users often don't have adequate knowledge for proper, proper stewardship 
of their resource. And they also have insufficient control over the protection of their source water. In the context of public health then, private well users are at a greater risk of negative health impacts from their water. So historical statistics in Canada show that about two thirds of waterborne disease outbreaks occur in privately owned wells or small drinking water systems. And if we shift to the global context for a minute, um, we see a very similar story. So globally, more than 50% of the population uses groundwater as a source for drinking water, and about 35% of the global population um, use only groundwater. It's their only source for domestic use. And then we also know that globally, 20% of aquifers are overexploited. And this happens due to mismanagement, as well as other threats. So climate change um, is a big one, urbanization, increasing populations, industrialization, I could go on, there's lots of threats. Um, but these threats and this mismanagement um, really results in threatening water security and particularly for people living in rural, remote and marginalized populations who rely primarily on groundwater. Overexploitation um, creates challenges beyond lo the loss of water supply. Uh, for example, we can see saltwater intrusion incurring, um, loss of wetlands and springs, and land subsidence, just to name a few. So, I don't have a lot of time today. What I thought I would do with, within the context that I just set is use the rest of the time to describe one particular project that I'm working on together actually with Dr. Corinne Schuster Wallace from University of Saskatchewan, um, Anna Majuri from Public Health Ontario, and Katie White, who is a PhD student at McMaster. And this project is at the intersection of the population that relies on private wells that use groundwater, um, which may be insufficient or contaminated. And so there is a real need for research at this particular intersection. Um, and so that's really where this project focuses. And the overall goal of the project is to develop tools for private well users so that they can better steward their wells, which will ultimately empower them to protect their own health and well being, um, as well as maintain these groundwater sources for future users. And from my perspective, I really think that a toolkit like this that empowers well users is a good step and an important step towards making the invisible visible. So you'll recognize the map of Ontario in the upper right hand corner there. Um, that is the setting for this particular project or the case study that we're using. And in Ontario, about 20% of the people or 2.9 million people rely on private wells for their drinking water. So the opportunity here is that we have a very large data set, um, more than 1.2 million E. coli testing records uh, from about, well, just over 159,000 unique wells with an average of about 11 observations per well. So I've got an example well record here, and you can see that the data set includes both physical and social information which speaks to the need for this coupled systems approach, right? If it's important to collect this information and then it's important to analyze it. And clearly it intersects. In the context of physical information, we know how old the well is. Um, we know what type of casing it has. We know how deep it is. We know what the stratigraphy is. We can calculate the well yield um, and there's more in there as well. In the context of social information, 
Um, we can answer questions such as, has, has this well been tested before? If it has been tested, was it at an appropriate time? So following a rainfall event, uh, is it tested often enough? Do the results from one test impact a user's decision about when to test the water again? So for example, you know, if I test my well once and learn that it's free from contamination, do I then just decide it's fine for the next 10 years and, and move on? So what we've done is we've taken this data set and we've added others to it. Um, and we're using many different machine learning techniques and I won't go through the list right now, but to answer some really important questions for private well users. So for example, you know, when's the most appropriate time to test my well? How often should I test my well? What's the lag time between a precipitation event and contamination arriving in my well? Um, am I particularly vulnerable to my well being contaminated due to surrounding land use and land cover? Um, does my well depth casing type make me particularly vulnerable? And I could go on, there are many um, similar questions that are important to answer. And we use all of this to bring together sort of a picture of vulnerability. The idea then is that we learn from these data to take appropriate action, right? We start with the physical and social factors. We couple these in a predictive risk model. And this forms the back end for an app for local um, private well users. So for an example, the app could provide early warnings uh, to a well user that rain is coming following a prolonged dry period. And the well user can then decide to either treat their own water, boil it, or test their well. Um, but they have the opportunity then to take action to protect themselves. The app could provide education. It could warn when neighboring wells in the same formation become contaminated. There's lots that it could do. So that's the idea of this project. And I'll stop there and just say thank you. Thanks very much, Sarah. And now I think we're ready for Carletta. I believe your microphone may be muted there. We can see the slides, um, just the, the sound. Good afternoon, everyone. I want to confirm that my slides are showing correctly. Yes, it's perfect. And we've got your audio now as well. Great, thank you. Yeah, good morning and thank you. Thank you to the Women and Water uh, theories and organizers for inviting me to be on this panel. I'm speaking from um, the University of Arizona, which is located on the traditional homelands of the Tahana Otham and Pasco Yaqui people. Today, I want to share a project that I have had the honor to work on with my team, which includes many universities and students who are involved, which is focused on the co-designing of uh, off-grid water systems to address amplified water insecurities during a pandemic. As COVID-19 spread around the world, it amplified food energy water insecurities, especially impacting Indigenous communities. And in the United States, where I am, COVID-19 was rampant on the Navajo Nation, which is the largest tribe in the United States, where um, uh, Navajo leaders cited the lack of healthy foods and access to running water 
as reasons for prolific transmission of COVID-19 and um, created in one of the highest uh, COVID-19 infection rates in the United States, third only to New York and New Jersey early on in the pandemic. Native Americans also have the highest rate of diabetes. Comorbidities such as diabetes and cancers are prevalent on the Navajo Nation. With over 500 abandoned uranium mines, Navajos are at risk for in, to environmental exposure. Arsenic is also prevalent in unregulated groundwater sources, which are often used for drinking water. Research has also linked arsenic-laden waters to diabetes, showing that diet is not the only cause for um, diabetes. Food, energy, and water insecurities were also amplified on the Navajo Nation, which came to light in the public eye, but it was all already well known across the Navajo Nation, where there are thir only 13 grocery stores across 25,000 square miles, approximately the size of the state of West Virginia. Furthermore, only 30% of Navajos lack, um, 30% of Navajos lack running water, 40% lack electricity. Uh, many Navajos have to haul water five to 50 miles away, incurring an enormous expense of $13 per 100 gallons, a comparison to nearby cities who only pay 40 cents per 100 gallons. So during the pandemic, the um, CDC guideline was to wash your hands for 20 seconds. However, for many of the Navajo communities who on average only use 30, uh, 50 gallons per day in comparison to 150 gallons per day for others off the Navajo Nation, water for hygiene is second in priority to water for humans, animals, and crops. So at the University of Arizona, I lead a training program where we are focused on developing te technical solutions to these challenges but training our faculty and students to understand the, the indigenous communities, um, the society, the governance and culture, so that they are effectively working in these contents with these communities. So we've been working with the oldest tribal college in the United States, the Met College, to um, develop a diverse workforce with intercultural awareness and expertise in the food, energy, and water system, specifically, through the, the design of these um, uh, off-grid water systems that's powered by solar. And so our students are involved in various aspects around these off-grid technologies, which also include drain houses. So since 2018, we have been uh, working with the NET College to co-design these off-grid mobile solar nanofiltration units to treat um, non-potable groundwater to produce drinking water. The unit sits on a trailer bed so that it can be um, uh, moved to any remote area and produces enough water for several families. So in April of 2020, we were contacted by the Navajo Nation Council and invited to think about how we can downscale these systems to the household unit so that um, households who are um, abiding by the stay at home order could get clean drinking water. We joined the Navajo Nation Water Access Coordination Group to uh, participate in cross university, tribal, state, agent, federal um, dialogues to address water insecurities. And out of these conversations, we were able to develop a Navajo Nation Water GIS portal, which provides data on water quality for unregulated groundwater sources. We also began in training um, a uh, grassroots community organization called Six World Solutions to downscale and co-design these household uh, water systems while um, engaging our, our students as well. So um, the co-design involved discussion about how these systems um, could be appropriate and placed for the Navajo users. 
Community engagement is important in our work as well as tribal approval. So we spent a year getting approval by tribal governments, um, local governments, and engaging the community to ask them for their input and their feedback. And part of that is doing um, some uh, focus groups to um, ask the people, what do they think about these technologies? And really stemming away from the helicopter research, dropping off technology, leaving without getting the um, people involved and um, making sure that they are owning it, they're driving it, and that it's stimulating their economy. So in addition to these focus groups, we've been um, uh, working with Six Rural Solutions to pilot these off-grid water systems um, in four communities. Um, we are we tested the water quality of the non-potable uh, water sources that remote Navajo families are using for drinking water, and then running it through the system to ensure that our units are working efficiently. We're also training the water user, having them involved in the co-design, modifying the system as needed, as well as training the community members um, in the process uh, of these piloting. Um, during um, the pandemic, the community engagement has been limited, but we are continuing that um, moving forward. So I want to conclude um, my sharing um, to ask um, this question that I've been really interested in about resilience. As we know, um, Sia Tali, which is a Canadian um, scientist, very well known for his work on resilience, but what does it mean for Indigenous communities? Um, how can we think about Indigenous resilience in Indigenous communities? How can um, they increase their capacity to respond to environmental challenges, climate change, drought, for example? And how can um, those, uh, what are those indicators and how can they be, be measured? So I've been thinking about this um, as I've started this center with my colleagues at the University of Arizona called the Indigenous Resilience Center to think about possible frameworks for um, Indigenous resilience and using um, a framework that my team had developed um, related to climate change impacts on um, tribal waters. We are using this framework to think about the resilience at different levels from household, community, and tribal nation levels. And in Australia, uh, they have done some work on this and have defined Indigenous resilience as it relates to um, the connection um, and belonging to the land, family and culture, identity, coming through um, adversities, um, including uh, racism and oppression, so that um, the community is not able to just survive, but to thrive in a dominant culture. So thank you so much for um, this opportunity to share. And I look forward to a discussion with um, the panel. Thank you. We're virtually clapping. Actually, we're clapping in reality, but you're seeing it virtually. Thanks so much to uh, Professors Chief and Dixon Anderson. Those are great, great presentations, super thought provoking about, um, you know, I really like the, the portable um, uh, the portable units that you talked about and uh, Dr. Uh, Dixon Anderson, the applications of, of big data. So it strikes me that in both of your presentations, you're both talking about resilience and Carletta really at the local scale and Sarah really at the re regional scale. And I uh, just wonder, you know, climate, the role of climate change, how does it, how does it impact the work that you're doing? Maybe we'll start, we'll start with the smaller scale uh, with you, Carletta, and then, and then hand it off to Sarah. Yes, I think for climate change um, impacts on tribal communities, the um, real unique aspect for Indigenous communities is that they are deeply connected 
to the place from where they come from. It's very different from non-Native Americans who view water as um, a commodity and a utility perspective, whereas Native Americans um, see water as sacred. Water is life. Um, it's part of their identity. For example, I shared my, my clans, three of my clans are water-based. Many tribes have water ceremonies. And so when you think about um, the reduction of water resources, um, not just for drinking, it also extends to spirituality, culture, livelihoods. And so that's why when I think about resilience in indigenous communities, it's not just about um, surviving or using drinking uh, water for drinking, it extends deeper into the culture and the um, the values um, of the people, which is very um, spiritual as well. And that spirituality connects to um, mental health um, and just the health, the overall holistic health and well-being of that individual. So um, when I think of the framework for resilience, that's why it comes um, at the household level, builds up to the nation level, and it has that connection to the community, the land, the place for which they come from. And that needs to be considered when we think about resilience, not necessarily um, taking the person out of that context of when we talk about water, it's really the whole well-being when it comes to the indigenous communities. Yeah, so I, I understand. It sounds like you're really talking about, um, and I understand from talking to other guests on the What About Water podcast, there's a lot more to it with indigenous populations. There is the cultural resilience. There's the spiritual resilience. There's the intergenerational resilience and water plays a big role. I'm learning that water uh, plays a big role in that. Um, Sarah, how about you and in, in how, how do you see um, climate change impacting resilience at the, the bigger scales or in the bigger data sets that you've been looking at? So, yeah, that's a good question. I, I think um, if we look at the impacts of climate change, so for example, uh, increasing groundwater levels or more commonly decreasing groundwater levels um, and increasing contamination. So that there's knock on effects from that, right? So, so if, we, if we have less water, if there's a drought, then people actually need to access more water because we have to irrigate more, we need more water. So we end up, you know, over pumping and doing things like this. Um, and the knock on effects can be huge, like land subsidence. Um, so, so I actually think when you, when we think about resilience, there's a number of issues. Resilience means that we have to be able to recover really quickly, right? And recover fully. And so one of the things that we don't do nearly enough of that we need to do is more monitoring and collect more data. We need to know that we're exploiting an aquifer before the land starts, starts to subside, right? That causes so much damage at the surface to infrastructure. Um, so, so I think there's actually a need for us to build a lot of resilience. And I think it comes from many different places, but a big one is much, much better monitoring and also much, much better management. And groundwater management is a challenge again, because it's that invisible thing. You know, we don't think about it enough and we don't think about how many different people are accessing and using that same aquifer and how those impacts add up. So, so yeah, from my perspective, we need to develop resilience through monitoring and management. So it's really interesting to me, Sarah, that my experience in California, of course, what you're saying is, you know, it makes total sense, but, but you know, most of the farmers, 
um, in California would be opposed to that uh, because, right, there's the fear that, you know, they might, people might think they're using too much water, but it's the exact opposite of what we need, right? We can't have resilience. So you make an excellent point that we cannot have resilience um, in, in our uh, adaptation to climate change if we're not doing the monitoring, right? We can't do the management without the monitoring. We don't have enough monitoring. And, you know, many parts of the world, there's a lot of resistance. So it's a, it's a, it's a conundrum. Um, and to the people that are out there listening or watching, this is, the, this is our lives. Uh, so we really grapple with this all the time. So we've talked a lot about uh, so far about quantity, but how about quality? And um, how about the impacts of groundwater contamination? How are they experienced in indigenous communities? And we can start again with you, Carletta. Great, thank you, Jay. Um, so uh, indigenous communities are so diverse. I mean, just in the United States alone, there are 574 federally recognized tribes. This is not including all you know, the state and those that are not recognized. So um, I don't wanna talk for all of the indigenous communities, but I do wanna say that um, resource extraction and exploitation has been prevalent in indigenous communities um, for um, you know over a century, and uh, and in addition to that, there are impacts from um, off tribal lands um, water contamination that um, the nations have to deal with, and um, excessive water uh, groundwater pumping. Um, and so uh, a a as a result, um, many tribes end up with having to deal with this uh, history of contamination that they were not part of. Um, for example, on the Navajo Nation with uranium, there are over 500 abandoned uranium mines. Um, that are just left there. And uh, many people have died um, because of exposure to these uh, radioactive waste um, from cancer and other ailments. And then um, not knowing that these exist in the groundwater and then they're drinking that groundwater. So of course, um, I, I second what Dr. Dickinson is saying about um, the need to monitor and to have that information readily available. Um, so that's what we try to do in our work is um, having that available um, with this collaboration to put this GIS uh, portal together to put it all on you know one repository because you know people come and go, they collect. Um, water samples, analyze it, put it in a paper or dissertation, but there's no central uh, repository for that data to be available to the people that live there. And so I think that's where Dr. Dickinson and I um, share similar um, aspects of our work is um, data sovereignty, data uh, access equity to the people who are being impacted by contamination. So once you have the information that your water is not of good quality, then you can take action. You're, um, you, you know that your water is not good. Um, so then you can resort to better quality water, other sources of drinking water that may be available so that you can uh, eliminate that um, potential health risk to an individual. So I think for Indigenous communities, that's really, um, I think, a real need and priority is having um, data access, data monitoring, uh, water monitoring that is accessible to the people. Um, and to be able to have that data to make informed decisions. Thank you. And, you know, I mean, you, you made an important point right at, at the end there about the, the uh, accessibility so that you can take action. And that's, that's, that's really important. Um, Sarah, I want to ask you a little bit about your thoughts on governance structures and um, how they could better 
consider the gendered impacts of things like groundwater contamination, groundwater scarcity, our whole groundwater crisis? Sure, okay. Um, so I think we have to start a, a little bit about with roles when it comes to water and groundwater. So if we look at different societies and cultures, um, different genders have different roles often and responsibilities. So often and in many places, women and girls are responsible for domestic water um, collection and use and also water stewardship and care, caretaking of water. And this includes groundwater, of course. Um, and so changing groundwater levels can mean that people have to go further, spend more time treating water so that it's potable, they may not have enough water to grow food. Um, and then so all of this can compromise the health of them and their families. And if we contrast this with the fact that in a majority of contexts, men often dominate the administrative and political and economic institutions, right? That determine the management of water. And so you get this dichotomy where women bear responsibility for water, but they don't have necessarily the authority that they need um, to steward things. So it, it can be a challenging place to be. Um, and of course, that's all very generalized. You know, it's not black and white like that, but that those are some generalizations. And so if we consider, um, consider what a better structure might be or what we can do. I think that we can think of it in terms of women's reach and their benefit and their empowerment. So I think gender considerations are largely missing from governance over groundwater resources because, well, because we, we don't, we're not always present in those spaces. And so, I think we need procedural approaches that require the full participation of women in decision-making and in institutions. Um, I think that governance frameworks should also consider how they benefit women. And so for example, through determining equitable access and use and ensuring that. And then if we think about empowerment, um, I think women should have access to justice and economic empowerment opportunities, and that requires access to water. Um, and, you know, thinking about existing and potential uses, so. Thanks for that, Sarah. That was quite, quite thoughtful. Um, I really, really appreciate it. Uh, Carlotta, I wanna go back uh, to you with a question about traditional knowledge. I mean, Western knowledge has, you know, has kind of gotten us in a mess. Uh, so what role does traditional knowledge play um, when thinking about sustainable groundwater use? Yes, thank you, Jay. Um, so traditional knowledge is really important to um, protection of water, uh, water use, water management. Um, in many indigenous communities, there hasn't been much data collection or monitoring. And so that is where traditional knowledge is even more important because the knowledge is held within the community about how water um, resources have been available through time, how it's been used, how it's changed. Those um, observations locally are important to understanding um, water in that place. And um, so uh, in our work, we rely on that heavily. Um, and that comes from the people to ask them um, what, what are their understandings about the water? Because they are the experts and they know um, how water has changed and been uh, used through time. And so um, uh, the United States recently, uh, the Secretary of Interior, Deb Holland, has um, recently um, uh, made a um, 
reckon uh, 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 I don't know what, exactly what it's called, but um, the importance of using traditional knowledge in um, the way that the agencies um, manage the water in the United States. And that's really groundbreaking because prior to that, it's never been um, included in governance or even in the funding um, mechanisms. Um, and so um, that's really, um, really uh, promising. And on the same side, um, I also want to say that traditional knowledge is protected by the people in the community. It's um, really up to them how that knowledge is shared um, and disseminated and included in any types of efforts with water. Thanks very much, Carletta. And that sounds very encouraging. Before I hand it back to um, Andrea for uh, questions from the audience, I wanna ask you both, if you could just give me a couple of ideas to share with our listeners um how can how can they get involved how can they learn more about groundwater this invisible resource what can they do to help protect it and uh sarah we'll start with you sure um i think there's lots that people can do uh, so there are so many organizations ngos um advocacy groups that work really hard to both educate and protect the groundwater. So just a quick Google search, I think brings about um, quite a few different potentials. I know right near me, there's a group called the Wellington Water Watchers and they do everything from, you know, advocate to um, provincial and federal government to hosting days that are educational for the community that they get like thousands of people out to their events. So to me, becoming involved in, in a group like this goes a long way. Sounds great. And Carlotta, what do you think? Um, yeah, I just echo what Dr. Dixon said as well. Um, there, there are many resources out there. And one that I really like is um, cooperative extension um, for the universities, that are land grant universities. There are many programs that involve citizen science, water days, ways to measure your water, um, different extension uh, fact sheet and videos. Um, really, our our goal is to develop uh, tools and education for the everyday person that may not have access to water um, information. And then um, in terms of learning more about Indigenous communities, um, I recommend also going online and searching uh, for various uh videos where there are some wonderful stories about different indigenous communities related to water. And I think these are great to watch because it really provides insight on the uniqueness of how indigenous communities view water as sacred and why um, there are so many water warriors out there on the front lines um, really wanting to stop water contamination in their communities. Um, Dr. Carletta Chief and Dr. Sarah Dixon Anderson, thanks so much for your conversations. Uh, I really learned a lot. I'm sure our listeners did too. And I'd like to turn it back over to uh, Dr. Andrea Rowe to uh, take some questions from the audience. Well, thank you so much for your wonderful presentations and discussion. Um, we've got a question from the audience here that I believe uh, is applicable to both uh, Dr. Chief and Dr. Dixon Anderson. And especially I'll begin with you, Dr. Chief, um, given your presentation on you know, COVID-19 and, and the, 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 you know, the recent pandemic and the impact of groundwater in the pandemic, um, uh, Tegan from the audience is saying a recurring theme I'm noticing in my research on water access issues is that women are often the ones who tackle this issue. Why do you think this is? And why do you think that women are more drawn to public health in general? And how can we close the gap? 
And I guess I'd like to add, did that actually, has that actually been something that you've seen in your, in your work? Ha have women been more drawn to public health work uh, in your community and in the communities in which you research? Or, or is, it, is it more balanced in, in your experience? Thank you for that question. And I like to just talk from my own experience and my own knowledge of this. Um, again, acknowledging that there's so many diversity in Indigenous communities. But um, in my community, just to give an example, um, we are matrilineal and matriarchal society where um, our identity comes from the mother. And um, even when a girl is born and they um, uh, become a woman, there's um, acknowledgement of their role and the importance of their role to carry the language, the culture, the knowledge on to the next generation. And so um, the, there's a big role for women uh, in that way in the society and also in the governance. So um, there, in, in my community, there are matriarchs who um, tend to be older um, female elders that they legally um, have management rights over their um, their land, their grazing areas. And so they determine who lives there, who's able to grow food, um, to use um, the, 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 the natural um, resources there. And, um, and I think both culturally that cult culturally and also with the identity that has um, continued to play um, through um, water, protection of water um, for those reasons, because you're thinking about the future, seven generations, the grandchildren, and um, protecting that water is for their health and for their livelihood. And so I think a lot of that comes through the value of women and the role of women in, in making sure that they do that, even as a young, um, as a young girl that, you know, they become a, become a woman that's um, acknowledged because they will carry that forward, the identity, those values, the language, and eventually become the elder that is the matriarch that has um, the, 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 um, the, the rule of how to take care of that particular homeland. And so um, I think that many indigenous communities carry that similarity of the importance of women in that way. And that's why um, there is definitely uh, more indigenous women involved in climate action, water protection, environmental advocacy, because it's not just, you know, a non-living resource. It's actually considered a living entity that has a direct uh, linkage to health and the well-being of the individual, of the family, the community, and the Native nation. Thank you, thank you. That's uh, very, very important uh, to consider, and uh, that it is about so much more than uh, just one generation. That uh, you know, protecting water for seven generations uh, is absolutely critical uh, to, to thinking about uh, women's involvement. And Dr. Dixon Anderson, um, we'll be giving the last word to you here as we're almost out of time. Uh, and, and I wonder if, if you're able to comment on the aspect of the question there about, you know, potentially in the Canadian case, over-representation of women in public health or under-representation of men in public health, uh, whatever way we want to look at that. This is such a different um, question for me. So I, I'm an engineer. I come from an engineering faculty and I spend half of my time thinking about how to get more women engaged. Um, so closing the gap sort of in the other direction. So I love this question actually. Um, if, if I think about it from, from the world that I come from, which is the engineering world, the research that they've been seeing um, 
in ways to try and reverse it there is that women really care deeply about social issues and societal problems um, and health is a big one. Um, and, and that's why they think that there are maybe women are underrepresented in sort of the more technical like electrical engineering or mechanical engineering. And I wonder if that argument could be reversed. Like maybe, you know, public health is a big social, social concern. And maybe that's why there are so many women there. If I knew how to reverse it, I think I would have been able to do better in my own space in engineering. Um, I think that's a really hard question, but. I don't have an answer for, unfortunately. Well, I thank you for uh, taking taking a go at it, and uh, and I think too, it you, you know the, the points that you're touching on really does relate to the framing as well, you know, uh, and perhaps um, you know it's uh, uh, framing public health in terms of the technical aspects as well as the social aspects, and a and you know uh, framing uh, things like electrical engineering in terms of the social impacts, not just the technical impacts, uh, and also of course considering the long term uh, um, impacts on the world and the cultural connection and really what it means means uh you know to to uh, embody your whole whole identity and what the, what you bring to your profession but also your your community and so i just want to thank you so much for uh your insightful discussion uh and your presentations today thank you very much to dr jay Fimolietti, uh dr carla chief uh dr sarah dixon anderson uh for sharing your insights and um, I would also like to thank uh, the team today, to everyone who has put this uh, event uh, on Dr. Dr. Corin Schuster Wallace for uh, her uh, ongoing leadership of the Women in Water series, Laura McFarland for technical support, uh, Fred Ryben, and uh, our colleague Sean Ahmed, who we can't see here, but who is doing all of the live streaming to the various platforms and creating that connection today, uh, as well as um, many others on the web about water team that have helped to make this possible, including Aaron Stevens, Mark Ferguson, Jesse Witto, uh, and, uh, and if I've forgotten anyone, I, I apologize, uh, because it really does take uh, a team effort to bring these uh, talks, and we really look forward uh, to um, continuing to host the Women in Water Lecture Series. And today, this is does mark our final Women in Water lecture for the 2022 regular season. Uh, but we are delighted to um, put a bit of a teaser out there that we are going to have a special Women in Water event on April the 7th. Uh, and so please watch our accounts for more details on this uh, exciting uh, special event. Uh, and we really look forward to seeing the Women in Water community and the What About Water community uh, joining us, as well as all of those who have found us today, uh, because you are very familiar with the work of Dr. Carletta Chief uh, and Dr. Sarah Dixon Anderson. So welcome if this is your uh, first time at Women in Water. Uh, and it's really been a pleasure. So at this point, um, the closed captioning and the formal live streaming on the various uh, platforms will end at this point. But we do invite anyone from the young professionals community, the Global Water Futures Young Professionals, if you would like to stay on for a couple of moments while we transition this over um, and just uh, make it possible for you to be able to unmute yourself, if you'd like to ask uh, any of our speakers today questions about your career paths, their career paths and advice uh, for those who want to do research and work in groundwater, um, our guests have kindly agreed to stay on for uh, another sort of 20 minutes or so uh, to take your questions and to, this is a fantastic opportunity uh, to, to ask these speakers, um, I'm sure many interesting things that will help you al along your uh, research path. 